So I'm pleased to present our guest speaker today, Jason Fry. Jason is a humanist activist and speaker on the topics of humanist philosophy, community building, LGBT and other civil rights, secularism and politics and religion. Jason is a humanist celebrant and the president of the Humanist Association of San Diego. You may have noticed an emphasis on beginnings today, and that's the very much on purpose. Jason's going to share his thoughts on the beginnings of living better, helping often, and wondering more. Okay. I'm just going to scoot you just down here real quick. Do you guys mind? Thank you guys for having me. I actually graduated from UC Irvine, so I was in the area. <laughs> Since this is sort of a seculars community, this could either be zot, 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 or zot, zot. <laughs> so beginnings, there's something I want to think about as we think about beginnings. My speech concerns itself a little bit with philosophy, a little sociobiology, and our ability to do things together. So I have been organizing a humanist group in San Diego since 2003, and occasionally we go out and do some homeless outreach. Um, it's an interesting thing to do. You learn all sorts of things. You know, the churches, they provide a lot of community services, but they don't provide tampons, for example. And there's a lot of women on the street, unfortunately. And here in Southern California, as opposed to, let's say, Boston or New York, what happens is in those cities, you'll have the upper 1% riding side by side with the homeless. There's a direct connection. But here, if you can't afford a car or have some other challenge, that's when you ride on public transportation. So there's a bit of a disconnect. And so in our projects that we've done and we've gone out there, there was a little bit of a story that I think encapsulates why we do this, why we come together and why we help people. So as we started our project going out, I give a little bit of a spiel on how these people are not a nuisance, they're our neighbors. They're our neighbors and not a nuisance. And we go out there. And the first time it was kind of awkward because someone asked us to pray with them. And we said, we'll just talk about, you know, good words of inspirational wisdom, but unfortunately that's someone else's job. But at the end we have a bit of a rap session. And at the rap session, one of the women who went out with us had tears in her eyes. And she had an epiphany. She said, I finally felt that I had permission to be nice to these people. It was that connection, that connection that we are so removed from in an artificial way that our natural inclinations, our biology automatically puts us into. And as we think about beginnings, what I want to think about is both the ethical side of what we're going to concentrate on and what we're working with so we can reach a great destination. We're at the start of something great. A couple years back, um, two comedians, Pippa Evan and Sanderson Jones from Britain, decided to make an atheist church that wasn't so anti-theistic. A time when we could come together and feel something, to be inspired, as the saying goes, to live better, to help often, and to wonder more. And I've given a lot of talks on community building, and there's something that I want to add to that, uh, an addendum of sorts, uh, to add inspiration and aspiration and community to this. And so as I go through my talk, I'm going to bring up beginnings, I'm going to bring up living better and what that means, helping often, and the foundations for that, and wondering more, and then to include these ideas of inspiration, aspiration, and community. So we've rationalized certain philosophies about beginnings, times that we come together. And in these times that we're forming groups like this, 
I think that um, there's a particular thinker that was one of the founders of the secular society from Great Britain that we should meditate on. He wrote a book called Prisoner for Blasphemy. He went to jail for a year for violating a blasphemy law. And as we come together, some of us atheists, some of us agnostics, other liberal religious people, um, George William Foote said that the free thinker of today should work on cultivating our own field and not merely raiding enemy territory. We get angry too much. And we don't work together when we're angry. We don't build things together when we're angry. And as we think about this, working together, cooperation, being inspired, these are the foundations of building something great. The Sunday Assembly can be something great. And Bertrand Russell, another great thinker, I like quotes, I like reading. Bertrand Russell essentially said, the mark of a good life is to create something that outlasts us. And as we start, as we create something at the beginning, let's try to create something that outlasts us. So we have to think about living better. What's the good life? What does that look like? Who's involved in the good life? Who deserves the good life? These questions, I think, are more easily answered through helping others, because we are not solitary individual beings. We're social animals. That's why putting someone into solitary confinement is torture. It's torture. Excluding people from other people is to torture. And we have to concentrate on our goals. Because it's not merely about what we want. It's where we want to go with it. I think that our goal should be happiness. Happiness is a good goal. Beyond that, to become more than we are. And to work together to mutually ensure these ends. That's the theme running through this. It's not merely about trying to become more as an individual. It's becoming more as an individual and helping others become more of an individual and sharing the fruits of that labor. Because there is truly a toxicity of individualism. Not individuality. Individuality is great. We nurture our talents. We nurture our strengths. But when we get ambivalent about other people, we close dialogue. We hinder our own social success. And we harm people. Exclusion harms people. And if our goal is happiness, inclusion should be our goal. So as I mentioned about the little anecdote that I did on homelessness, the idea of helping often, that idea, these people are our neighbors. They are not a nuisance. All too often, we step over homeless people. We ignore them. We ignore people. We're geared towards it. If you look at how houses in the United States used to be, they used to have huge porches where neighbors would talk. Kids would play together. And what happened to porches? What happened to, the, what happened to them? What are they like now? You have a gated community and you have a step, if that. You go through your garage. You don't talk to your neighbors. What happened to political discourse when we closed ourselves off, had a fragmentation of political media? We got way too polarized. There's a whole phenomenon about that. When things get polarized, people, they get too oppositional. They don't have dialogue. And then political apathy sets. And it's called demosclerosis. It's harmful to democracy. I think democracy is a good thing. And so looking at the foundations of what we have to work with, the foundations of why we help people, I think that we think about how these ideas developed of why we get together into groups, why we help people, this idea of the social contract, to meditate on that for a moment, and then think about how the ideas and thoughts of this have changed. I would like to call it social contract of sociobiology. The initial ideas of why we came together was we deliberately came together. We started off as individuals in the state of nature. 
and for protection. We came together, we mutually agreed to come together, and um, yeah, and we established a set of, of guidelines. Well, as we learn things about how mammals and human beings have advanced, you know, how we've developed as a species, we know that we didn't start off as Adam and Eve and, and Jim and Steve and all these other people. We started off evolving from other species that developed from other social in-group living species. And we evolved in terms of who we saw as people. The idea was we had people and lesser people. For example, if you go to San Juan Capistrano, there's a mission there that said the missionaries came to enlighten the noble savage. God made white Europeans smarter and more capable than those other people, which enabled a lot of harm, a lot of death. Um, and then we came up with this idea that it was man versus animal. This idea that we were creatures of reason as opposed to those other critters out there. And then we developed that even further as human beings, as animals, and we started looking inside. And we started sociobiology and ethology and seeing how we relate to our closest relatives and what our common connections are. And they're rather fascinating. Those ideas that we started off as separate beings deliberately coming together enforce an idea of individualism, of selfishness. But when we look at sociobiology, we're uplifted with the fact that we're socially driven in what we do, both by mostly choice and also involuntary action. It's quite fascinating. Our neural wiring inclines us to do such. We are in-group living social animals. And it's really interesting because that whole people versus animals distinction kind of gets muddled when we look at cetaceans, whales and dolphins, when we look at other primates, when we look at elephants, we look at ravens, they have these weird little nerve cells that are prevalent in high degrees in animals that take the perspective of another animal. It's something really fascinating. It's called the rouge sham test. You can take Vaseline and a, a grease paint of a certain color and put two marks on the side of an animal that takes the perspective that has this idea of a theory of mind, put it in front of a mirror, and it will automatically start going like this. It has a sense of the self but also it has a sense of others. It's quite fascinating. Another thing about this is that we have this weird part of our brain that enables us to feel a sense of shame and embarrassment. If you damage it, you lose all sense of shame. There's a guy by the name of Phineas Gage who was injured in a railroad construction accident. A metal rod went right through his head, damaged that portion of his brain, he wasn't the same gauge, his friend said. Um, we also have this wonderful hormone called oxytocin. It's a trust hormone. And there's all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, and it leads down to psychology. For example, when people say that what we do is all deliberate based upon what we see other people do, that's not quite true. For example, if I were just to start yawning right now, and I weren't telling you that this was the trick. And I was, you guys would probably start whining, whining, yawning. It's called an emotional contagion. And here's another thing, and I'm going to make this more family friendly. There's a psychologist from New York named Jonathan Haidt, and he uses this example in his classes. And I'm going to use this example in a more family friendly way. You can imagine the more adult way. You have a guy, pays his taxes, goes to work, doesn't break the law, then he goes to a farm and he buys a chicken takes the chicken home, and for the kids, he makes out with the chicken. For the adults, he gets intimate with the chicken. Is that wrong? Who here felt that was gross? Who here got an instinctual reaction? Who here thought that was gross? It's more of a feeling. If this were CSI, and I took a doll, and I said, point on the doll where that man made you feel the sensation of gross, you'd probably point here because it's your vagus nerve working with your autonomic nervous system. 
We're a social species. And considering the fact that most of us felt this, there's this whole social component. This stuff is really fascinating, and I wish I had more than 15 minutes because I could talk about this for hours because it's so incredible. Another last thing on this aspect of helping each other and being good and us being a social species is the idea of overriding norms and latent psychological predispositions. So there's a great field that's emerging about studying political psychology and civil rights. And there's a wonderful book called The Race Card that examines how, as a country, how we think and, and place equality between people as our, as our overriding norm, why we have such an inclination to, be, to racist ideas and to dehumanize other people, mostly people of color. And the idea is this, is that we have latent psychological predispositions, some of them ethnocentric, and we have competing social norms. And what happens is, um, as times change, norms develop, and I wish we could go into a longer discussion on this because this is so fascinating too, but when these norms of equality that the community adopts come into conflict with slight psychological predispositions of a dislike of a certain group of people, the idea of violating those norms, the embarrassment of that, will cause someone to instantly switch to the overriding norm. We also have metaphor. We have metaphor. We package meaning in representational ideas. For example, love is a journey. You're falling into love. You're falling out of love. We have this social capacity that's so wonderful. These foundational things that bring us together. On top of that, there's another field of study relating to this called social capital. The value of social networks. When you guys and me and everyone else gets together with people they otherwise would not connect with, the effects are you vote more, you volunteer more. The pro-social effects of getting together with people you otherwise would not meet are expansive. They radiate outwards. There is a direct social benefit from that. It's called social capital. And so we have this incredible foundation, this altruistic, pro-social foundation that we're working with. So we help each other. That's where it comes from. We try to rationalize altruism out of existence. If someone were to drop their wallet out of their pocket, it's a low-cost altruistic act for most people to say, hey, excuse me, you dropped that. Most people, they'd be instantly inclined to do that. Other people, and keep in mind there's this whole idea of who's in your in-group and who's not in your in-group. Your family is your in-group, for example. Um, you're more likely to do high-cost altruistic acts. But there's also times when there's crises and emergencies. There was a video on CNN recently of a woman who lost control of her pit bulls, her two pit bulls, and they went and they attacked a 60-year-old man. Do you know what people did? They didn't just take their phones and video it. They could have been attacked by the pit bulls as well. You know what they did? They just instantly acted. We do that. We try to rationalize altruism and being good out of existence because of certain philosophies that say we're rationally self-interested and we do things for selfish purposes. But when the rubber meets the road, our brains and our better angels of our nature just kick in. They co-opt us into action. And our social circumstances lead us to forget that we have permission to be nice to quote unquote those people. And so the fact that we have this basis is one thing. Another thing, the last thing I'm bringing up, the wondering more. We have this unique ability, as I said, by metaphor to add significance to things. We have significance. How significant, how amazing is it that we can find things significant? We can set things apart. We can find them sacred. Who here is going to go out tonight and look at the moon as opposed to other nights when the moon is out? Why are you going to go look at the moon tonight? What is so special about the moon tonight? It's just a block of rock circling around the earth while the earth is circling around a star and it's just kind of going to get in the way 
of, of the <laughs> shadow behind the earth. So what is significant about it? And why do we feel it? And why do people cry at eclipses? Why? Because that's another thing. We have the capacity to wonder. And the fact of the capacity to wonder also does another thing. When we get caught up in ourselves, we might get solipsistic. We might assume that what we see around us is the world. Our small perspective is all that matters. But when we go out and we look at the blood moon tonight, or we go for a walk in nature, or we go and listen to some beautiful music or see a beautiful painting, what happens? We are reminded, and also by the Carl Sagan poem, we're reminded that we're just a smaller part of things. We're interdependent. It's not all about us. We are interdependent. And there's poetry. Of course there's poetry. Sunday assembly to wonder more, to be inspired, to be uplifted. I'm a humanist celebrant. I do weddings. And when I do a wedding, I usually end with this poem. And I'm nearly done, and I'm going to end with another small poem. But Max Ehrman's poem also brings to mind this element of significance, that you're not just a small component of something, but you're also crucially important. Max Herman's poem, The Desiderata, says, you are a child of the universe. No less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. So, in conclusion, when we're thinking about these bases of what makes us good and what makes us social and what leads us to helping one another, I want to think about inspiration, aspiration, and community. So the Sunday Assembly is more than just a place for atheists to complain about God. Actually, the whole point is to avoid that. Friends DeWall, again, I mentioned some of Friends DeWall's work a moment ago. He said, the success of a secular society depends on far more than God's death certificate. <laughs> So what do we think about this? Where do we place ourselves? We place ourselves in a position with other lines of thought. And we can share that ability to be inspired, to feel a sense of awe. We can look at particular scriptures as being poetry. We can look at other forms of poetry. But we should share this ability to be inspired with other people. It's a wonderful thing. It's an important thing. Um, we should be inspired when we look at history because some people say we can't touch sacred ideas, but I think it's more inspirational to see that we're not just a subject of history, we're also its author. We're a participant. That should be rather inspirational. We should not simply acquiesce because we're a participant. We're the benefactor of everything that's come before us. And we're the sculptor of everything to come after us. On top of that, we have the potential to be great. We're starting out with some really great stuff, this pro-social behavior. We have some tendencies towards selfishness, but we can actively work against that. So with community, we have to think about what type of community we want. And we also have to remember that as we look at what we want from the world, we can't do this alone. We have to go out and do good things, share them, and cooperate in making a good life together because there's only one life and we're all in this together. To recap, as George William Foote said at the beginning of my speech, the goal of the free thinker is not merely to raid enemy territory, but to cultivate our field. And our field is laden with these great altruistic foundations and seeded with our ability to wonder and how much better it is to wonder together. And like I was saying, I always end with a nice little thought. This is a great thing to meditate on in terms of what we want for ourselves, what we want for the world, and a good reminder of our place in the greater aspect of things. And this is Robert Green Ingersoll's Humanist Credo. Robert Green Ingersoll says, justice is the only worship. Love is our only priest. Ignorance is the only slavery. Happiness is the only good. The time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here.
The way to be happy is by making others so. Wisdom is the science of happiness.